Hey guys, this is John Blau with the Post and Courier. I cover Clemson for you guys. Um, this is our weekly countdown to kickoff feature and to kind of set the framework for anybody who's new and attending and watching or just listening on the podcast version. Um, we, we do this every week, uh, try to preview the upcoming game. Uh, it's also an occasion where uh, my marketing folks want me to tell you about the uh, Tiger Take newsletter that we have. Um, basically my stories, uh, I'll send them to you in, in an email newsletter version with other, you know, tidbits and things like that that don't get in the newspaper. Uh, but this is also one of those things um, that kind of spins off of that, the, the countdown to kick off. But if you want to subscribe to the newsletter, that's uh, postingcourier.com forward slash the tiger take. And now that I've done my whole spiel, we're going to introduce Tim Bray, uh, the former uh, football SID for Clemson. Tim, how are you doing this week? Doing great, John. Good to be with you. I appreciate you being here. And uh, so the last time that Clemson went to Pittsburgh was at 1947. I think they were playing Duquesne. Uh, I know you were around for a long time. I'm guessing that was long before your tenure as SID. That was eight years before I was born. Um, but yeah, that game was at Forbes Field, the famous Forbes Field. The game was played just 13 years prior to Bill Mazeroski's famous home run to win the 1960 World Series against the uh, the Yankees. Uh, uh, one thing I found interesting is that Bobby Gage, uh, of course, was uh, Clemson's top player in that game, and he had 179 yards uh, uh, total offense. Uh, but two years later, on that same field, Bobby Gage had a – 98 yard run for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He was actually the first round draft pick of the Pittsburgh uh, Steelers. And until the last couple of years, that was the longest run in Pittsburgh Steeler history. And which, and the other thing I found out about it when I read stories about that run, and I've actually found the tape of it on YouTube, uh, it was a fake punt. Can you imagine a fake punt from your own two yard line? Uh, and I, I've, I've seen a video of the play, and it's apparent he didn't fumble the ball or anything like that. Uh, I assume he took off on his own, but uh, it's quite a place. Most of fans should go on YouTube and, uh, and Google that play. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of crazy. I would hope that the coach wasn't thinking about going for it at their own two-yard line. I would hope that was just a situation gone awry there. Um, maybe a bad snap. I, I don't know, but well, no, I saw the play and it wasn't a bad snap. I mean, it, I assume he took off on his own. Um, but it was just, uh, as we say, those were different times, but they weren't that different that they were going for it on fourth down from your own two, but, uh, crazy play. Yeah. And it's actually interesting. I mean, coming out of last week, it kind of segues to Syracuse a little bit. Um, we did have a fake punt, uh, with Will Spires. Uh, he, he, he actually showed off that he used to be a high school quarterback, uh, threw it to Davis Allen along the sideline. Great catch by Davis Allen. Um, turned out to be a really, really pivotal um, play in the game because, again, this offense at times is having trouble, you know, sustaining drives and, and scoring points. So um, that fourth and five actually kind of ended up uh, leading to a late first half touchdown and, and helped Clemson kind of get in the driver's seat, which helped them eventually kind of hold on. Um, I guess, Tim, what, what did you see from the offense again, you know, this week? I mean, what, what are the, the issues if we're going to kind of like go over them again, line by line? Let me first make a comment on, uh, on Will Spires and that uh, it seems like Dabo has cooked up a fake punt for Bill Spires against uh, Syracuse every year. That's actually the third time uh, that he's had a fake uh, punt against Syracuse back in the 2017 uh, game before you got here. Uh, he did, uh, you know, he said he took off on a run and Dabo said it was, you know, he had made that decision or something he saw. Then last year, he had a six yard run for a first down against Syracuse and then had this really nice pass uh, to, to Davis Allen. And, you know, I've gone to a lot of practices. And one thing they do on Thursday is they have practice kickoff returns. As you probably know, special teams are big on Thursdays. And so instead of uh, in the indoor facility having the punter punt the ball, uh, Will will stand at midfield and loft a beautiful, perfect spiral 50 yards to the end zone. And that's what they use uh, to, to take off and, and, and return the ball. So 
having seen him do that pass, he is, he can really throw the ball very well. So that did not surprise me uh, what he was able to, uh, to do last Saturday. Now, as far as the Clemson offense is, uh, you know, concerned, um, you know, we continue to, you know, have our good plays and have our bad plays. I, I do think the, the positive has been, uh, you know, rushing the ball, especially from the running backs. Um, our top two backs right now, uh, Mafa and, uh, and um, well, I always forget the other guys. Kobe Pace. Kobe Pace. Pace. Yeah. K pace. They, they're averaging 5.26 yards a carry uh, so far this year. And last year, our top two running backs, Travis Etienne and Lynn J. Dixon, they averaged 5.26 yards a carry. Uh, so they are having similar rushing per, per carry, um, you know, stats. And I did think we ran the ball effectively. Um, DJ completed 21 of 34 passes, his best completion percentage against an FBS uh, uh, team. Uh, but, you know, there were, you know, there were some, some drops, obviously in the first half, uh, there was a, there was a drop by Ross. Uh, there were some other drops during the game. Even uh, Allen had one, even though he had eight catches in the, uh, in the game from his tight end position. So, um, you know, just consistency on, you know, we didn't have that many three and outs, uh, but we didn't score that many points. So, uh, obviously they got to finish off, uh, some drives and, uh, you know, in, enhance their efficiency. Cause it's going to be hard to hold Pittsburgh in that 17 to 21 point, uh, range. They are uh, third in the country in scoring 48 points a game. Uh, Kenny Pickett, although he's been awful against Clemson in his two previous appearances, uh, has been great this year with 21 touchdowns and just one interception. Yeah, and he had four interceptions against Clemson last year. And that was three in the first quarter. Right, exactly. It's kind of an interesting transformation for him. I mean, he's been a good quarterback for, for a number of years, but he's putting up Heisman numbers uh, this year. And I think Brent Venables even compared him to Joe Burrow as maybe his closest comparison. Um, so, I mean, have you, have you seen a quarterback kind of make that kind of turn that late in his career, the, the way he's playing right now, or is that, is that hard to, to think of a comparison other than Joe Burrow? Yeah, um, you're right. He does. He kind of does remind you of Joe Burrow the way he plays too, uh, which is very scary for Clemson fans, uh, um, obviously. Uh, you know, as I think back in Clemson history, um, the, the guy who came on, um, and had a good senior year, um, although we hadn't played that much previously, uh, it was a guy named Chris Morocco who took us to a, ten, a top 10 finish in 1989. But he sat behind uh, Rodney Williams his first uh, three years. So that's really not a fair comparison because Chris didn't play, but he did come on very strong, you know, at the end of his, uh, of his career his senior year. And the same could be said for Will Proctor, uh, though, but he was sitting behind uh, uh, Charlie Whitehurst. So as far as Clemson history is concerned, I can't remember a guy who's, you know, been the starter and then his senior year had this great year, certainly not to the extent that, that Pickett has. Yeah. And we talk about Clemson's offense trying to keep pace with Pittsburgh, obviously. Um, a lot of attention has been paid to DJ Uyungle just because he's the quarterback and that's the nature of the beast, I guess. Um, Dabo has said that he believes, you know, DJ has really improved over these last couple of games. Uh, if you eliminate some of these drops, I think there's probably a half a dozen of them uh, in the last game. You know, DJ's stat line looks a little bit more impressive. Um, I guess, have you seen, uh, you think, some more composure, some more, you know, just being able to execute the offense uh, seeing that growth from him and what is it around him that needs to be shored up, I guess, to kind of make it a little bit easier to get first downs and score points. I think of the uh, line on the old Saturday night live uh, television shows, Roseanne, Rosanna, Dan, and when she always says, there's always something. And there's been something different, it seems. Uh, that's played the offense as we've as we've gone along. Now I do think the offensive line has played better, but then you get all these guys, you know, hurt, and we can't have a uh, the same center or uh, same cohesiveness in the in the offensive uh, line. It seems from week to week. 
Uh, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, the drops and they've been a key situations, you know, with the complexion of the game been a lot different early. If Ross had caught that pass over the middle, somehow he got his feet, uh, uh, tangled up and dropped the ball where he was wide open at, uh, at, at midfield late in the Boston college game and got it, uh, Although we had to go down for it, it still was right in his bread basket to catch what would have been a touchdown pass from Uyunglele. And, and it'll be honest, and Uyunglele has been inconsistent at two. It seems like sometimes he gets happy feet. Uh, it seems like maybe there's be some coverages he might not expect. And then he's like, you know, you kind of look at him like, well, what do I do now type of, type of thing. Whereas, uh, you know, Trevor seemed like he would go from one read to another seamlessly. And that's, you know, probably something that's just going to take, take some time with experience for young Lale. you know, Clemson fans just aren't used to having to wait for their quarterback to improve. Uh, you know, Taj Boyd from the time he was a sophomore uh, in 2011 led us to great victories against Auburn and Florida state and was, throwing for 300 yards uh, very early in, in his career. Uh, uh, Watson had injuries his freshman year, but he also had a uh, six touchdown game against NC State and played a great game against North Carolina, you know, before he got uh, hurt. And then, of course, came back in 2014, had a brilliant game against South Carolina. And then, you know, Trevor was good from the get-go. He had three touchdown passes in his very first game as, as, a, as a player. And, of course, we never lost a game Trevor's freshman year. So Clemson fans are spoiled, uh, and, but it's been very much out of the ordinary that we've gone this many years w without uh, seeing a, a quarterback, you know, having to make progress over the course of his first year. Yeah, and it's also just a unique time. And, and Tony Elliott talked about this a little bit and just the season in general. I mean, you talk about they went through a pandemic the, the entire season last year. That, that was kind of odd uh, to kind of have to go through that. The pandemic's still going on to a degree. You got name, image, and likeness coming in for the first time. And so that's an extra pressure on these guys getting back into the routine of their life just in terms of classes and being in person and things like that. Um, just a lot of different psychological pressures you know the stadiums being full again and having to deal with that after it being you know tamped down uh, last year um and he feels like you know obviously things haven't gone perfectly right so they're starting to put pressure on themselves and it, and it becomes a psychological thing um i guess i mean you would have dealt with the media i guess to an extent uh, you know with football um how much do these guys read their own clippings how much is it a struggle to, to get them to kind of you know worry about the outside noise and to just you know play play football just play have fun i guess well you know it's interesting that you bring that up is because of course Dabo brought it up at his press conference uh yesterday and i kind of had to chuckle because you know Dabo really doesn't you know he doesn't go on twitter and and follow all those things i personally think that Dabo was, he, now on Saturday, I'm sure he watched game day. And I'm sure he watched David Pollock get on there and basically said he was through with Clemson, I think was the quote that I saw, uh, you know, from him and the other guys were pretty much, uh, had great expectations for Clemson's offense and uh, against Syracuse and in their minds, you know, did not deliver. So I think that was the genesis of uh, Dabo, you know, saying that, um, you know, when I was, you know, his, his SID, I would bring articles to him that I thought he needed, you know, to know about to the extent that Ross is doing that now. Um, you know, I'm not sure, but he's aware that there's criticism out there and I'm sure he knows that his guys, you know, go on Twitter and the different things and, and see whether it's from the media or from, you know, fans. There are, there are probably more of you turn on the radio and he did mention the radio there's it's more comes from you know the, the fans that were that would call in they want to change the quarterback they want to do this they want to do this they want them to take 20 people in the transfer portal uh you know all these different things that i'm that in the end of the day he's gonna do what he felt has led him to be successful like they've been the last uh, ten, 10 years so uh, you know, I don't think there being any, any, any changes and 
but the degree to which players are affected by the criticism, uh, you know, I don't know. Some of them will follow it because I know from my interaction with them, uh, you know, some guys will talk to me about some things that were, I know Charlie Whitehurst used to follow it and we'd talk about some things who were written. Um, but, you know, I don't think, a lot, you know, Taj Boyd, when I was with him, uh, you know, he just when I love to go out and play and he just played. So each guy's kind of different. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to like talk to Charlie Whitehurst and say, Hey man, just ignore it. Like it doesn't, doesn't matter. Or, or you just kind of tell him it's not a big deal or kind of how do you, how do you deal with that with that? I guess. Well, now you got to remember Charlie's father was an NFL quarterback. So he was in tune to things. And, and so uh, it just, he was very mature. I mean, Charlie Whitehurst was a senior when he was a freshman. Um, and so there were some things that, uh, uh, you know, took place in 2003 when Charlie was, a, a sophomore and we lost the game at Wake Forest and everybody thought that, uh, coach was going to get fired. And there were a couple of writers that were, uh, bothering, uh, Charlie more. And he, you know, he followed what they read, but he, but he was smart. He, he didn't let it bother him. It was more like we were, it was more like we were in communication about it was almost as much as he was letting me know what the media was saying to him and some of the questions that that they were so almost to help me as much as I was trying to help him. That makes sense. Um, yeah, and I think one of the other things that uh, Joe Ajo talked about, he had a rough play on that game against Syracuse where he just kind of missed a block. And as he explains it, he was he was thinking about where is Davis. Where is Davis Allen on the screen? And so I can block him on the inside or the outside, kind of help. Um, but by the time he kind of turned his head around, the guy was right by him. Uh, but he said that, you know, they had a team Thursday chat, I guess, with um, Dr. Mel Louder, who's a sports psychologist. And they were saying, he was just saying, take it back a few years, you know, remember what it was like when you were a, a junior high, a high school player, you were just playing for fun. That's all you got to do right now, you know, and then that's kind of the message I think that the coaches are trying to instill to the players right now is just, uh, you know, go out and have fun. Obviously you have to do your job, but Joe, Joe has to make that block. Uh, but you also can't let it manifest and turn into something bigger than it is. Um, so it'll be interesting if they can play free. Cause like you were talking about, I mean, Pittsburgh, they score a lot, a lot of points. Um, I guess defensively, uh, that's going to be an interesting matchup yeah, as well in terms of the Pittsburgh you know, defense against the Clemson offense. Um, I know that Tony Elliott said that they don't have the defensive ends that they had last year. Those guys have graduated, but they have a couple of war daddies, I think was the word he used, on the inside of defensive tackle. So uh, that interior offensive line is going to be tested, and uh, Mason Trotter probably going to be the center again uh, because Hunter Rayburn's out uh, with COVID. So it's going to be interesting, Tim. Yeah, it, it will. Uh, let, me, let me just get back to the a Joe and Joe play. I, I know Dabble was especially frustrated by that play because I went to practice Wednesday and Thursday and they practiced that play. I don't know how many times because it was the first time we'd run that type of play with the tight end flaring out uh, like that. And I'm sure the element of surprise is what they were certainly uh, hoping for. And so I know that's one of the reasons Dabble was frustrated because they had worked on that play so much, uh, you know, during the week. Now, as far as, you know, Pitt's defense, uh, you know, from a Clemson standpoint at uh, watching the Virginia Tech game, that was what was kind of scary to me that they played as well as they did defensively against, uh, you know, Virginia Tech. You know, I watched the Virginia Tech Notre Dame game and they, Virginia Tech scored no 29 points on Notre Dame's defense, which is not that bad. And for them to really shut down Virginia Tech's uh, offense. Uh, granted, they had some injuries at, at quarterback, but but uh, still, that was pretty Im impressive to me. You know, they jumped up twenty-eight to nothing, and then just kind of coasted. Uh, you know, from there, uh, and they've they've had a pretty good balanced defense. They haven't given up a lot of yardage, uh, with the exception of that one outlier game against Western Michigan when they gave up forty-four points to them. I'm still not sure how all that happened although it was one of those early season the games and early in the season things like that can can happen but uh yeah it's gonna be uh, gonna gonna be a, a certainly a, a test tigers are gonna have to run the ball maybe we're not gonna see them run the ball up the middle quite as much as they've been doing lately from 
the matchups of what you just said. Might have to run a little bit more outside between the tackles. I'm kind of still waiting for the game when, you know, we have uh, Uyungle, uh, you go with that run pass option and, you know, keep the ball and go around right in like he did against Boston College last year for a touchdown. Yeah, I mean, it seems like DJ, one of his strengths uh, is definitely as a runner. I mean, he's obviously a very, very big guy at 6'4", 250, uh, big Cinco. And I think Dabo called him little Cinco for a little bit when he got under uh, 250 there. But um, but he can definitely put his weight into people and he actually can make people miss uh, in the open field. I mean, in terms of the combination um, arm strength and, and the legs that DJ has, I mean, is that one of the better combos you've, you've seen, I guess, at Clemson when he, when he puts it all together? Yeah, well, we've had great combos, uh, you know, the last 10 years in that area, Taj Boyd was a very powerful runner. I mean, third and one, third and two, it was uh, snap the ball to Taj and let him run over people. That was very effective for us in Taj's career. Of course, uh, Deshaun had a thousand yard season in 2015 and uh, was just terrific on the run pass option to pick up a lot of yards. And then Trevor, you know, didn't run it as much, but you know, uh, he's he was much quicker than people thought that long touchdown run he had against Ohio State in 2019 and I've seen a couple of plays in the NFL that I know he's surprised some guys getting around the end he is uh, he has got much more speed than you would think and he's got more speed than uh, the DJ has but DJ does have a good combination of speed and can make some guys miss and has the ability to run over guys yeah uh, I guess just an aside, did you watch the um, Jacksonville Miami game? Because I think that I heard that, I mean, Christian obviously made Christian Wilkins made life a little miserable for, for Trevor. And that goes back a ways in terms of Christian would take the ball, I guess, from Trevor when he was a freshman and kind of nag him and, and do things like that. Yeah, of course, uh, he, uh, Christian will do things like that to everybody just to get, uh, you know, get in their head. But uh, you could see that, uh, yeah, there were a couple of times. But, you know, early in the game, I saw a, a short, real uh, subtle where he, uh, not the one where he sacked him, but this that there was another play. That he, he tackled him, not real hard, but tackled him. And they, uh, and when they stood up, they kind of slapped hands as they went back to their respective. I thought that was kind of kind of neat. But yeah, tr- uh, Christian had a great play on Trevor. We had a, a sack and caused a fumble. And, and Miami, uh, you know, did recover. Um, but I didn't see them really kind of jaw to jaw like I've seen Christian go with. Uh, he actually did with Hunter Renfro in a game earlier uh, this year. But the guys know Christian and it's all kind of in fun. And they uh, all meet after the game, take pictures and switch jerseys. And in the case with Hunter Renfro, Hunter lets Christian hold his newborn son uh, in a picture they took after the game. So that was all, all kind of neat. Yeah, it's all just fun and games on the on the field, and then afterwards, obviously, they're they're friends again. So, um, so I guess just keys to the game, I guess, going into this Pittsburgh game, and we've kind of laid it out in terms of you know the offense and the defense. Obviously, uh, I'm going to have my eyes on Mason Trotter in terms of how much more continuity do they have with a guy who literally just got his hand out of a club um, last Sunday. Um, you know, before you not this past Sunday, the Sunday before that, the Sunday before the game, and then was able to snap and had one bad snap. That was not very good, but otherwise, you know, they did were able to run the ball a decent amount. Um, that's going to be key. How much continuity can they get up front of me? Is there anybody else that you're looking at and saying, this guy needs to have a big game, or I want to see a step forward from this person? Kind of what are you looking at there? Well, uh, you know, the SID in me always kind of looks at, uh, you know, interesting storylines that, uh, that could happen. I think it would be kind of neat if uh, Justin Ross, who over the summer had to make many trips to Pittsburgh for the last two years and have back surgery and, and all those uh, doctors up in Pittsburgh that got him back uh, healthy again, it would be kind of neat to see him have his best game this, uh, this season. I'm looking for him to have a hundred yard game. Uh, and it's, that's going to be important. Now, you know, historically Pittsburgh, um, uh, you know, hasn't played a passive bend, but don't break defense. They'll play us some press man. So I'm hoping that's going to create some opportunities. I think the key to the game 
is for DJ to hit some long passes to Ross or and and Gata to kind of um, open things up. You know, quite frankly, he hasn't been that good on the long aerials. Um, you know, this year he's hit a couple and you know, past and God, it was big, um, uh, you know, last week, but I think that's going to be a key to game. The Clemson is going to have to hit, hit some long passes. And like I said, it'd be a neat story if, if Ross was uh, on the uh, end, end of those. Uh, another key I, I see is Clemson's ability to control the ball in terms of time of possession. Some uh, coach Bowden used to talk about, you don't want to give a really good offense, a lot of at bats. And so I think if Clemson has a bunch of three outs, like three and outs, like we had against um, NC State, uh, and and you give uh, you give Pickett a lot of opportunities, you know that's going to be a, a problem. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, you know Clemson can have some ball control also. Yeah, and again, that's establishing the run game. It's not getting the third and longs. I mean, one of the things again, they, they did run the ball decent at times, uh, but they had nine third and longs that I counted in the first three quarters. Uh, last time out against Syracuse and that kind of really limits what you can do in terms of stringing drives together. So that, I mean, that will be important uh, how well they run it. Um, and also like, yeah, like you said, I think Tony Elliott said that, you know, the, the long pass is what Pittsburgh essentially gives you. I mean, they pretty much dare you to go deep. Um, so yeah, DJ has got to connect on those receivers have to catch them. Uh, a lot of things have to come together that haven't you know quite come together uh, yet this season, but like you said, um, Justin Ross would be a great story. I mean, if that happened, I think Dabo says the only time he's ever been to Pittsburgh was, uh, for Justin Ross's surgery and, and to be there with him when that was going on. So, uh, the return to Pittsburgh, um, for the first time since 1947, uh, will be an interesting one, uh, for Clemson. Cause this is a really, really meaningful game against Pittsburgh. I mean, is this about as meaningful uh, an ACC game as we've seen in a while. I mean, I guess it feels like every ACC game is is meaningful right now just because of the way the season is going. But well, we went through a lot of years where Clemson was so dominant in the Atlantic Division that uh, you know we'd get off to great starts and we'd go eight and zero, seven and one. You know, we never lost more than one game. So the uh, the the standings, uh, you didn't really have to look at that 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 much. But uh, you know, this year, uh, you know, especially if we can win this game. Uh, and then you watch to see what NC State does in, in all of their, uh, you know, games. Uh, you know, ha they all have impact, kind of like what we've kind of followed from the other side of the equation on the Coastal Division, where every single game is is very meaningful and has an impact on the standing. So it looks like it may be that side on both sides uh, this year. Although, you know, we're not giving Wake Forest any credit. They haven't lost in the league yet. So let's see what they can do. Yeah, there are a couple weeks down the line. Um, Clemson will have a chance at them. I just – one more just interesting stat. I actually thought, saw it from the athletic uh, stop rate. Uh, the number one team in the country is Georgia. The number four team in the country is North Carolina State, and then it's Clemson. So Clemson has played two of the top four defenses in, in the country in terms of stop rate. Um, this is kind of a little bit of a different challenge. This is how much can they you know, drop some bombs on the other side, but I mean, it shows you they've played some pretty good teams that have some pretty good um, success against other teams as well. It's not just. Yeah. Them. Especially on defenses, John, you're hundred percent right. You know that we talk about Clemson's rushing, we're averaging 4.3 yards a carry this year, which is not that bad. In fact, it's the same number that the 2016 national championship team averaged and you know that includes the first game in which we had 23 carries for two net yards so if you take out or if you look at just games that Clemson has played against teams that are not number one in the nation in defense we're averaging 4.8 yards a carry which is uh, is pretty good so uh, so we'll have to see but you're, you're right about the uh, the defensive line for Pitt is is pretty strong and it's going to be a, a, a challenge we're going to hit some passes to try to open that up Absolutely. So yeah, so that's pretty much our time today. I'll tell you one more time if you want to, you know, obviously come to these weekly, but also uh, our newsletter, The Tiger Take, you can subscribe to that at postandcourier.com forward slash The Tiger Take. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for stopping by. And uh, Tim, as always, thanks for uh, joining me. I appreciate your perspective. Good to visit with you, John. All right. We'll see you. Thanks, guys.